for that uh, glowing introduction, <laughs> only some of which is really accurate. But <laughs> and uh, thank you also, and Kit and Janice, for making it possible to uh, be here this Saturday. I, there's always one thing you forget, which is the sponsor of today's mm -hmm. talk mm -hmm. is our friend no. Janet. And your last name? Gaston. Gaston. Mm -hmm. Janet Gaston. So our sponsor is right here in the front row. Thank you for reminding me. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. Thank you for coming out on a <laughs> splendid Saturday. Uh, I think the first question that I need to address is, uh, what is uh, Zen? Uh, the word itself dates back to the old Sanskrit tradition uh, when the word for meditation was dhyana, uh, D-H-Y-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, or dhyana. And when Buddhism moved north from India into China, the Chinese pronounced it chana, and when it moved off to the northeast to Korea and uh, to, to Japan, the Japanese pronounced it Zen. So Zen in this sense is a school of meditation that originated uh, back in very ancient times. And those ancient times started with the story of a young man, uh, Siddhartha, <clears throat> who uh, was on a meditative quest to understand the meaning of life for six years or so, starting when he was 26, and who, after this uh, six-year interval, finally decided that he was at the end of his rope and concluded that he had better sit and meditate under a Bodhi tree. And the event that happened when he awakened or when he became enlightened uh, has uh, been the pivotal core of uh, Buddhism ever since. How are we doing for sound in the back? Can you hear me? Okay. So, uh, in the neurological sense, uh, Zen is a system of brain training, of retraining our subconscious awareness, you're aware that you're aware, but that's the awareness that is conscious. What you're not aware of is your subconscious awareness, and that's going on all the time, only you are not currently aware of it. And we'll be hinting more at that latter kind of awareness uh, in Zen training. Uh, now, after 2,500 years ago with the Buddha, uh, Zen then migrated north from India and uh, went elsewhere in Asia uh, via the southern route, southern route to uh, Sri Lanka uh, and to Burma. <coughs> and then north to Afghanistan. And if you'll pass this handout around, courtesy of Hal Roth, uh, you'll be able to trace some of the subsequent growth of Zen in Asia. In the West, uh, we really owe our knowledge of Zen to uh, D.T. Suzuki a uh, Japanese author who wrote more than 30 books in English on Zen culture. <clears throat> and uh, as it happens, uh, Zen finally came to the awareness of the editors of Time magazine <clears throat> in 1997. And, of course, the allure of Brad Pitt on the cover did something to perpetuate uh, this. 
but uh, the cover reads and the cover story is on Buddhism. It's on uh, America's fascination with Buddhism, in case you missed this in 1997. And it talks about two new movies, celebrity converts, and hundreds of books adding zest to Zen. <clears throat> So we'll pass this around too, so that you can be familiar with this new view into a very old system of brain training. <clears throat> the second question uh, that I think we need to address is something more about the speaker. Uh, who, who is speaking with you today? Who really is speaking with you today? Well, about 40 years ago, uh, I could venture this comment <clears throat> on the speaker. <clears throat> uh, this was in my first book, uh, Chase, Chance, and Creativity. Uh, for the author said, I write with some personal bias and some eccentricities, which should be declared at once. I find medicine and science are meaningless unless they are interwoven with the rest of nature, with the arts, and with the humanities. And so with that brief introduction to the author many years ago, it's time to turn to an idea which uh, Gladys uh, has uh, brought to our attention uh, long before, which is that you can speak from the platform here uh, until the cows come home <clears throat> and issue words. But it's also very good to have examples, visual examples of your own artwork. And the particular artwork that I've chosen is a pot uh, I learned how to be a beginning potter in uh, Kyoto, Japan. And after uh, returning to uh, Denver, uh, I fashioned this uh, by hand, following the contour in the form of a Chinese original, uh, which uh, didn't have very much of a flower pot function in old China. And since Zen is a product of both uh, China uh, in its Confucianism, its joining of Buddhism, and its Taoism, I found that this symbol of a three yin and yang, not a two yin and yang, uh, was exemplified in the uh, uh, in the end part of a roof tile in Kyoto that happened to be lying on the ground. So that in this pot, the name of which is Zen, you see a fusion of China and Japan, of Taoism, of Buddhism, and Confucianism. And that's the cultural basis for the Zen uh, that we uh, know today. Thank you, Gladys. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <clears throat> so my first interests were in creativity. <clears throat> and uh, this is uh, updated uh, in the first chapters of Living Zen Remindfully, which is the latest book in this series. <clears throat> I was interested in how creative ideas begin, and some of these creative ideas are uh, the result of insightful or intuitive processes, not well thought out serially, but things that flash in suddenly. And that, of course, was what happened to Siddhartha under the Bodhi tree. <clears throat> so the first chapter is entitled, Can Meditation Enhance Creative Problem-Solving Skills? A Progress Report. 
<clears throat> and I've usually found that having a quotation from some other person often centuries before was a good way to introduce uh, a chapter topic because most things actually have been said better in previous centuries than they are today. But in any event, this is what a researcher had to say recently. A state of conscious awareness that results from living in the moment is not sufficient for creativity to come about. To be creative, you need to have or be trained in the ability to carefully observe, notice, or attend to phenomena that pass your mind's eye. So you're, you may be born with certain creative gifts, but from then on, you have to be very a skilled and attentive person notice a lot of things and be able to pull them out of your memory and join them in some concept uh, at a later time. <clears throat> this pursuit on my part <clears throat> of ordinary kinds of insight <clears throat> and intuition uh, led to the third book in this series, <clears throat> uh, Selfless Insight. And there are some particular quotations in the section labeled on the nature of insight uh, that are uh, instructive. One is by Robert Henri. <clears throat> Robert Henri was a uh, teacher of art in New York. Uh, he lived from 1865 to 1921, and he was a very a good teacher of spontaneity in art. <clears throat> he said, there are moments in our lives when we seem to see beyond the usual and become clairvoyant. We reach then into reality. Such are the moments of our greatest happiness, of our greatest wisdom. At such moments, there is a song going on within us to <coughs> which we listen. It is the desire to express these songs from within that motivates all masters of art. And our songs have much to do uh, with our temporal lobes. And that has been a constant theme uh, in uh, much of the work uh, that follows. And Carl Jung, <clears throat> who lived from 1875 to 1961, uh, had this to say about the topic of insight and intuition. He said, certain contents issue from a psyche that is more complete than consciousness. A psyche that is more complete than consciousness. They often contain a superior analysis or insight or knowledge which consciousness has not been able to produce. We have a suitable word for such occurrences. The word is intuition. So this is one of the themes uh, that we'll be developing. Intuition, insight, ordinary uh, insight, and selfless insight. But the third question to attend to is how can we train our attentiveness? How can we train our ability to notice? How can we train our subconscious awareness? <clears throat> this is explained in the next book, which is Meditating Selflessly. 
Its subtitle is Practical Neural Zen. And here we make a bold attempt to take what's been learned in neuroscience uh, and uh, blend it into uh, Zen training processes that enable simple meditative techniques to be more effective. <clears throat> On page uh, 81, uh, it has another example of the kind of art that uh, people in the neurosciences need to develop uh, in order to make a very complex uh, subject matter clearer. So you need to go into the visual, as Gladys Swan has emphasized, in when, because words are not enough at certain points. <laughs> I'll try to illustrate this with a uh, handout, uh, which is an enlargement of this color plate. But it's something that I had to develop in order to indicate what it is about our visual field, uh, what you're now seeing as you sit there, and how different parts of what you're seeing in your visual field originate back in your brain. This means that in one figure you've got to have a brain shown, you've got to see what the brain is seeing out in the world, you've got to make this concept come forth, and then you have to put enough color into it to develop the notion that the northern parts of the brain, northern, which I've illustrated in the left hemisphere here, are up here in the superior part of the brain. These northern egocentric, self-centered oriented parts of the brain pursue a different pathway from the southern roots, largely through the temporal lobe which are oriented toward perceiving uh, things outside one's sense of self. And since ego refers to self, it should by now sort of become clear that allo stands for other. They're both Greek words. Egocentric, allocentric. Self-referent, other-referent. What does this other referent part of the brain do? I can't convince you of this, but I can only tell you <clears throat> that it allows you, as you are sitting here at this very moment, to perceive the world outside your skin in an anonymous way. The key word is anonymous. There's nobody back here in the center of your brain that is possessing this moment for you. This is a reflection, if you will, that proceeds anonymously and subconsciously, courtesy largely of many nerve cells that happen to pursue a lower part uh, in, your, in your brain and be pulled together into a coherent but subconscious registration. So what is this egocentric part of the brain largely set up to accomplish? The things in the brain are complicated and they cross over, which means that the upper part of the brain is chiefly oriented toward focusing toward the lower part of the environment and especially to the lower part of the environment that you can reach out into in your lap close to you and accomplish things in. This means anything you can manipulate with your hands lies below your horizon of vision down here close to you in what is called technically peri-personal space. On the other hand, 
what you can accomplish through the allocentric pathways in the lower part of the brain is more oriented to what goes on out of your reach, out farther in the horizon, where vision and hearing help you hear saber-toothed tigers that are in the nearby bush before they wind up in your lap. <laughs> <laughs> so in this one figure, uh, there is a lot of information that talks about the different styles mm -hmm. of attention, that talks about northern and southern roots, that talks about focal attention, talks about global attention, and summarizes a lot of very complex uh, information. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Kathy mentioned that there would be something about haiku uh, in this uh, talk, and I don't want to disappoint her. <clears throat> And so I will give you a very Zen haiku to mull over. The Old Pond. Frog jumps in. Plop. That's all there is. <laughs> there ain't no more. <clears throat> Three lines. And the emphasis is on direct experience. What are you going to be going through as you hear this? You're going to be hearing the plop. Hearing is a temporal lobe function. <clears throat> You're going to be hearing something that is pretty unusual. <clears throat> This chapter is entitled Basho the Haiku Poet, and I'll read a few lines. <clears throat> this essay's motivation began over eight decades ago. I grew up in uh, a city in northern Ohio. <clears throat> Not until I visited my uncle's farm in Ohio at the age of nine did I first hear this distinctive plop. It arose from a region several yards away. <clears throat> Here, a pool lay hidden beyond the bend of a gentle meadow stream. What caused that curious sound? I went there, saw nothing, remained mystified. But days later, I finally saw an actual frog leap into the water. Simultaneously, I heard what happened. This sudden comprehension resolved the mystery. It left a deep impression that remains memorable to this day. In these next pages, we take a neural perspective to examine the evidence, pro and con, that Zen sensibilities came to mature in the later life and poetry of the man who came to be called Matsu Basho, who was born in 1644. <clears throat> One of the things that Basho did was become very sensitive to direct experience in the outside world. <clears throat> And in doing so, he imported many of these moments and put them into his poetry. He wrote a total 
of 1,012 haiku, which had been carefully looked into and brought uh, into a uh, single book. And by accessing uh, Basho's uh, trove of these thousand or so poems, it becomes clear that at least one out of six of his later poems were specifically triggered by his uh, noticing birds. Now, ordinarily, those of you who write poems do not uh, count for one-sixth of your total by focusing on birds. <laughs> but Basho did. <clears throat> Basho did. And um, we put a number of these together <clears throat> uh, in uh, one of the uh, in one of the uh, chapters <clears throat> in the earlier book, Zen Brain Horizons, uh, in the chapter called Avian Zen, because there's a whole trove of ancient Zen stories that talk about how seeing or hearing birds acts as a physiological trigger that captures attention and that triggers the emergence of a spontaneous uh, state of uh, heightened attention awareness and some of which go on to an enlightenment kind of awakening. <clears throat> <clears throat> The chapter entitled Avian Zen has two interesting and very pertinent uh, quotations. The first is by Henry Thoreau, one that I hadn't heard of or at least hadn't noticed before I became aware that in Colombia uh, there was a, a younger woman who exemplified the Audubon approach to life. Uh, <clears throat> and Thoreau said, I once had a sparrow alight on my shoulder. Imagine a sparrow on my shoulder. I felt that I was more distinguished by that circumstance than I should have been by any epaulet that I could have worn. <laughs> and the next quotation is by Zen master uh, Shunru Suzuki Roshi, uh, who had a very uh, prominent uh, Zen center in San Francisco, <clears throat> and who modestly said, I don't know anything about consciousness. I just try to teach my students how to hear the birds sing. Avian Zen. <clears throat> so what we've tried to do in this uh, single large uh, table in Living Zen Remindful is go through uh, Basho's uh, haiku, particularly the latter 800 of them, and go into the number of different kinds of birds that he found uh, so worthwhile to notice and pay attention to and incorporate into his own haiku. The chapter is entitled Zen and the Daily Life Incremental Training of Basho's Attention. The Daily Life Incremental Training of Attention. The Little Moments of Heightened Perception uh, and Awareness. 
It's introduced by two quotations. The first is by a Korean Zen master, Sung San, and he said, keep your mind clear like space, but let it function like the tip of a needle. I know of no single sentence that more neatly encapsulates uh, the kind of result that meditative training is designed to produce. A global awareness that is clear like space and simultaneously the ability to penetrate to a single sharp top-down focus of attention and to be able to switch back and forth the two, between the two with great flexibility to take in the finer details, the fine grain perception, and the global big picture. This is the essence of meditative training in whatever school uh, you belong to. And the second quotation is by Jose Ortega Gasset. Tell me to what you pay attention, and I will tell you who you are. We're each motivated by a lifetime of experiences to pay different kinds of attention to different things in our lives. And these are our, the signature of our personality. Certain things turn us on, certain things turn us off. That's who we are. <clears throat> so the avian theme in Zen uh, is also uh, brought out in another title that has a humorous twist, uh, which is entitled, Sometimes Zen is for the Birds. <laughs> <laughs> it starts with a quotation from a Zen master back in the 10th century, Fen Yang, who said, the sound of the bell, the chirp of the sparrow. It's through these that one meets the true source. Seeking it someplace else is a deluded waste of effort. I was reading in a Buddhist uh, journal a year or so ago and came across an account, uh, an article written by Peter Coyote. Uh, how many of you recognize the name, at least Peter Coyote, as somebody you've heard about before? Okay, a few. Well, I didn't know that Peter Coyote was a Zen student. I knew of him as a, a narrator, as an actor, but P uh, Peter Coyote was a long-standing student of Zen and went on a long retreat uh, when he was 68 uh, that he found uh, pretty rigorous. And the story that I read <clears throat> went like this. On the sixth day of the retreat, late in the afternoon, he had just stepped outdoors and took several paces to begin the next period of rapid walking meditation. And suddenly, a bird nearby started to shriek, <coughs> startled. He heard these cries as the answer to a koan that he had been working on in a way that seemed to be the direct answer to the question of his column. One step later, and he had dissolved 
into an enlightened experience entitled Kensho Satori. Every old boundary vanished that has separated self from other, ego from allo. Nothing remained of his former fearful defensive self. Nothing remained that had to be done. An all-inclusive awareness perceived this larger domain. It had no physical location. This was an anonymous awareness. It was inseparable from the entire universe and was perfect without time, eternal in his words. <clears throat> Uh, I thought this was pretty interesting, and so I sent uh, a, a copy of this story uh, to uh, Peter Coyote. And lo and behold, he thanked me and uh, thanked uh, Janice uh, indirectly uh, because she had supplied the fact that this bird <coughs> was a scrub jay, not a camp jay. <laughs> I rely on this authoritative kind of uh, support uh, uh, and regard her as a muse who has directed me in the direction of avian sin. <laughs> the next question is why does awakening occur? <clears throat> Uh, that's a very tough one, and I'm not sure that I can answer uh, this from this platform, even given a lot of time. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, if you have a lot of technical background, you would be able to decipher uh, this figure, which indicates uh, in graphic form, uh, the fact <clears throat> that deep inside the center of the brain is a structure known as the thalamus that is in intimate contact with the cortex, that is in oscillating contact with the cortex and that if certain parts of the thalamus are inhibited by an inhibitory transmitter, GABA, that it is then possible to turn off the fearful uh, self-referent self that gets in our way and to open up the passageways so that more of our allocentric anonymous processing can go out. And I'll pass this around simply to illustrate that there are figures that approach uh, this topic, uh, which is one in which words are no longer uh, adequate. <clears throat> now there are some other chapters in this book. Uh, there's one about a record-setting baseball hitter whose name is Sean Green. Uh, there's something more about haiku poetry. There's something more about the uh, enso or the circle that's on the cover. That circle was taken from a uh, book of calligraphy, a booklet of calligraphy, that was given to me by my calligraphy teacher in Kyoto, Teriyama Sensei, who gave me, as I was leaving him, a circle done with his brush which is the kind of cultural treasure that 
one receives in Japan when one enters into the culture as a uh, fledgling student, <clears throat> and uh, which is given to one by the instructor with examples of his own calligraphy to motivate one uh, when one returns. Thank you. When one returns to the uh, other world in the West. And I think we've posed enough questions and have dangled enough elusive answers uh, before the group this afternoon. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your anonymous awareness. <laughs> and uh, let's proceed to questions and answers. You went to Kyoto you, you, in 1974. Yes. And have you been back? And um, many times, or have you been I'd say maybe work? seven, eight times. Uh, I, uh, my teacher, uh, Kobori Roshi, uh, was alive for uh, much of that period. And uh, himself uh, was a calligrapher and potter which served to motivate some of my own efforts in both directions. Uh, his uh, calligraphy was uh, very fluid, uh, quick, spontaneous, uh, but it was interesting that after he went to China on a visit to mainland Zen centers, mainland China, uh, it became more classical and structured and followed the orthodox uh, traditions of uh, China at that time. <clears throat> uh, just recently, so this first book was uh, translated into mainland Chinese uh, characters. Uh, but I think I should uh, mention that it had a very difficult time as a project uh, working its way through the bureaucracy and the censors, <clears throat> uh, which was not the experience that uh, the, the uh, Taiwan version of the book had. Yes, ma'am. What kind of things were censorable in that book? Well, um, the whole notion of uh, a quasi-religion or uh, spiritual movement uh, that was close to Buddhism, Tiananmen Square incident was very uh, powerful still in the minds of the Chinese bureaucracy when a single person faced down a tank. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so uh, that was a sort of a, uh, unorthodox movement that tried to object to the prevailing norms. And uh, Buddhism in China around 840 or so had another uh, time in which it was suppressed as a foreign import. So the notion of some uh, way of uh, thinking or believing or acting that comes from another country is uh, even with us today uh, in this country. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Glad. Have you noticed in your uh, practice of calligraphy and in your uh, practice of, of uh, making pottery, you have those moments of insight and awakening. Is that familiar to you through the practice of those arts? 
I can't in all honesty say that uh, making a pot uh, has uh, been uh, the trigger for an awakening experience, but uh, I have noticed that when the pot actually managed to come out through my hands, there was a feeling of great relief. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, I, but I can say that um, the notion to put together a brain on the one hand and a visual field on the other hand was a notion that sort of took form someplace below consciousness. And uh, maybe with a little extra help from uh, the kind of reveille in the early morning hours uh, that enabled the two to coalesce on one page. A question over here. Yes, what? If one is to practice uh, mindfulness as you seem to recommend highly, <laughs> what, what kind of a, a schedule do you suggest uh, in, in a general way a person should do? Is this a daily thing? Uh, uh, mindfulness is a process of daily training oneself. Daily training. Okay. To uh, pay a deliberate attention to the present moment, to what's going on, uh, and to savor uh, moments of appreciation or reflection, but then to be able to let them go and to move on to the next moment. Uh, it's also, in a general way, an invitation to get adequate amounts of sleep so that one isn't sleepwalking through a day, uh, to get uh, nearer the ideal of seven or eight hours of sleep rather than fitful sleep. And um, <clears throat> It's an invitation to be more introspective and about one's um, failures and assets uh, so that uh, there is a more of a monitoring uh, of one's way of living that develops at uh, deeper levels of the subconscious. Because Part of the goal here, the unannounced goal, is the kind of spontaneity that one sees exemplified in a Zen master, which is a quick, automatic, reflexive, all-encompassing, uh, total response to the immediate moment in a way that's supremely fitting to the occasion and is expressed without undue fear or without much uh, self-involvement. Uh, it's a kind of a reflexive uh, ability to be like the baseball hitter who in one major league game could hit five homers. One game. Okay. Yes? Uh, Leonard Cohen was a uh, Leonard Cohen was a Zen practitioner. Yes. Do you see in his music uh, an expression of that? I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I don't because I'm not familiar with Leonard Cohen's music. Uh, I just know that he uh, lived in a, a Zen community, a Rinzai Zen community, uh, and he himself felt that his Zen meditative <coughs> training was very important to his spontaneity. Mm. Uh, speaking of a uh, Zen poet who died recently, was also a notable musician. So I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Yes, sir. I assume that the goal or the hope would be that uh, Zen would be practiced by, by everyone in the world. Perhaps because I get that way because when your books they talk about altruism 
Yes. Like, and the focus on compassion yes. and otherness and such. Yes. And I was wondering what thoughts you have in terms, not that there can be world peace, this is not a beauty pageant per se, but that, uh, that perhaps even at a younger age we might acquire some of these traits of, uh, I guess you say, autonomous, anonymous, excuse me, anonymous mm -hmm. mindfulness at, at, at an early age, other than just perhaps coming to this study and interest at a later stage in life after perhaps a, a crisis of medical disease or something like that? Well, the good news is that a uh, uh, non-religious identified kind of meditation uh, in the form of being mindful has been introduced into grade school classes now, uh, not only in the West, thanks to the efforts of uh, John Kabat-Zinn, mm -hmm. but throughout the world. So there's a lot more uh, opportunity to get into a meditative approach to life uh, than there was two decades ago, especially three decades ago. Uh, four decades ago, uh, an academician uh, would be embarrassed by getting up before you and saying that he was a Zen meditator. <coughs> That is no longer that is no longer the situation. Will this be a benefit to lawyers since they're now doing it? I well, <laughs> a good friend of mine, Len Riskin, uh, occupied a professorship at the university in the law school yes. <clears throat> uh, on the basis of his ability to say, "Hey, you guys are fighting all the time with each other, and contending. Nobody's winning." But if you learn how to meditate, you'll be able to readjust your competing impulses, and everybody will come out a little better. And that was his pitch, and he was a very valuable faculty member, like other faculty members, has been recruited away to the university before. <laughs> I, I sat with him in the group when he first joined uh, the meditative practice. Yes. It was, okay. Uh, so it you're was old, profound to witness his transformation. Yes. yes. Okay. So you're an old hand at this. Uh, I'm just an old hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's why that is fine. <laughs> Jim, I think this is just a comment on what I find is the beauty of getting into writing allowing yourself to sit in a quiet place with mm -hmm. a blank piece of paper in front of you or a blank screen mm -hmm. and go into that place and see what's in the mind and see what spills out on your your page mm -hmm. it is a for me writing has become over the last quarter century a kind of meditation yes and the wonderful part of the journey is you don't know where you're going when you start it. Exactly. It just takes you with it. Mm -hmm. And I know Greg is, is, <coughs> Usaker has just published his first book of poetry, and poetry comes to him from some other place that he lets his mm -hmm. mind go. And you know, in stressful times, uh, you know, I recommend it for everyone. And and sometimes it's picking up a book that somebody else has written, mm -hmm. but that where you can go in and get lost in that story. I'd like to say a out. word about this other place you're talking yeah. about, because the uh, figure that we passed around uh, shows that one of the other places is a distant scene in the mountains with a bit of blue sky up above. Mm -hmm. And this refers in a very direct way to the way the allocentric form of processing takes in the world above the horizon. Contrast that with how many of our people in the younger generation and in the other generations are now occupied every day with mm. their uh, handheld mm -hmm. fiddling around typing in texting situation, which is an all down, very personal space, self-centered, within reach, 
And one of the interesting things about uh, being a nature-oriented person uh, is that uh, studies have been made at Stanford <clears throat> uh, of the creative impulse and the socially oriented altruistic impulses of people in two groups, some of whom went into a very tall eucalyptus grove at Stanford, which is one of the highest uh, uh, trees in North America, aside from the sequoias. And just being in an atmosphere, in an atmosphere in which there are green trees at higher altitudes and looking up and getting out away from the south back in the center is very conducive to uh, more affirmative impulses. So uh, getting out for a good nature walk, Claude, <clears throat> and not staying too long writing down with what's going on in your lap <laughs> it's also a way to help sponsor mindfulness. But, but your example about being in the forest of eucalyptus yeah. also invites an enormous aroma. Yeah. Well, that, yes, that's true. But even uh, 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 virtual reality situations that approach without aroma, the upper visual fields turn out to be more creative and affirmative. Mm -hmm. yes, Can Mark. a person trained in Zen move from uh, information, of which there is too much, too really, much. in my opinion, mm -hmm. but move from the necessary information we must have mm -hmm. into this more uh, altruistic, larger world? Can we learn to toggle back and forth well, um, we do it all the time. Some people do. Yeah. <laughs> we do it all the time. Um, and and uh, we're not talking about multitasking necessarily here, because multitasking is a whole different subject. But we're talking about flexibility in moving from the pinpoint to the global from the focal to the global and back and forth at just the right time, allowing the global to take in realms of information and the focal to work on and digest what's important, and then back and forth again. Yeah, that's known as fluid intelligence. And uh, um, 63 Zen students who had been meditating for up to five years were studied in nineteen in two thousand twelve, uh, and uh, it turned out it, even twenty minutes of Zen meditation was important enough to provide a statistical increase in their ability to solve uh, creative types of problems with remote associates or uh, extra kinds of uh, creative tests. So with regard to Zen itself, uh, Zen has short-term influences on creativity when Zen meditation is followed immediately thereafter by the uh, tests. If you're asking a long-term question, no, longitudinal studies have not yet been done. Proven studies. Have not well, in a way, you're an example of that because you mm -hmm. focus on medical and scientific data, mm -hmm. but you refer it to a larger world. Always. Yeah. I was doing that before I got into Zen. <laughs> Well, on that note, it's 11 o'clock, and the eucalyptus trees are out there somewhere. And Joe Chevalier has very patiently been meditating at the table over there. Joe and Jim, thank you so very, very much. Thank you for your attention.